and welcome to another video. Nice to see you again. Um, I'm so excited to share this project with you. I've made a lot of baby shoes before, but I've never made a pair of shoes for myself, let alone historical reconstruction, so it's all rather novel. So to give a bit of context, we have to track back to 2019, when two medieval leather shoes and a handful of fragments from the same dig ended up on my desk at university. They'd been sent in by a client for some remedial conservation work and as my passion is dress history, <laughs> I jumped on the opportunity to work on this object myself. A, what was supposed to be a couple of week long project turned into an eight month long overhaul of everything that had gone wrong with the object since it was dug out of the ground in 1961. That would be a whole video in itself, so back to what you're here for. So it's very rare to find complete medieval shoes, so a lot of this reconstruction is conjecture based around what I can learn from the extant object itself. Ta-da! In this case the shoes that are circa 1350 to 1450 AD based on the pointy shape of the sole which was fashionable during these times. Because only the sole survives, the upper, or vamp as it's more properly known, is purely my hypothesis on what it could have looked like. And if I'm honest, personal preference, I enjoy the whole pointy medieval shoe thing. But I fall over my own feet enough as it is without putting a point on the end of my foot. And any shoe that sticks out past where my footplate is on my wheelchair, they just get destroyed. There's nothing saying that these were really long pointy shoes, they aren't a particularly high value object in this context. Editing Zoe here to say that further research that I've done suggests that these shoes were owned by a tradesperson and then they were either handed down to a growing adolescent or sold on to a person of lower status in medieval Scotland at the time as they appear to have been altered to have the point be smaller now that I've spent more time looking at different vamps and other contemporary shoes. So yes, I'm making peasant's shoes but the shoes themselves started off as a object owned by somebody of the tradesman's class because it was second hand it was then a lower status object, the point got in the way, at some point it's been basically chopped off and sewn back together again. So while very pointy shoes, sometimes known as pulains, I hope I'm saying that right, were wildly popular during this time period, at certain points they became so long that they had to be stuffed with moss to prevent the points from collapsing. So I chose to make a more practical workman's style shoe and while traditionally they would have been t leather fastened probably with a leather toggle or some side lacing. I did go for a button and there's no reason that the shoe originally couldn't have been fastened with a button. It's unusual and unlikely but there's no reason that it couldn't be. So because I'm gonna wear these <laughs> I used a button. I did make sure that my button was as medieval looking as I could possibly find but we're going for historically adequate not historically accurate because we don't have reproduction medieval tools for example um, or indeed really any proper leather tools. I wasn't really willing to spend lots of money so that's why I'm not saying it's historically accurate and what is historically accurate? Anyway, most tradespeople were learning as they went along, they weren't writing it down. So while some woodcuts and illustrated manuscripts and stuff do survive, they don't tend to really walk you through the process as it were. So a lot of it is conjecture. Okay, so I went for secondhand leather, which is a little bit more ethical because I didn't know if it was going to go well, <laughs> you know, if it went terribly. I didn't want to buy brand new leather, which had to come from somewhere, obviously an animal. Now some people might ask, why didn't you use pleather? I didn't use pleather because pleather is plastic. It will shed little bits of microplastic all over into the environment and then it will end up in landfill, whereas leather is biodegradable. Otherwise, we would be up to our ears in shoes, which we're not. So I made them out of leather. So, pleather, not very medieval. 
on to the shoes because you are not here for my rants about <laughs> the use of plastics. So the first thing I did was trace my foot on paper and I had a exact copy of the original sole of the shoe that I was working on and my foot was not much smaller than the foot of the person who would have worn this originally. Now actually I made this shoe a little bit too big, now I would definitely make it a lot closer fitting. I used regular brown packing paper to kind of work out how big I wanted the upper to be. Here you can see I am using my cup of tea as a pattern weight. It's really professional here, and I'm just drawing round the shoe. To now, this would have been done with a sharp object known as a gouge, or just with the point of an awl, except I didn't have one at this point, so I was just using a pencil. I don't have the medieval lucette, which is a crescent-shaped blade, so here I'm just using regular scissors. One thing a medieval shoemaker would have was a wooden last, which is basically a wooden object in the shape of a foot, and to get it to the client's measurements, they would build it up from a basic shape with leather scraps or rags. Now, I wasn't about to sit and carve <laughs> a wooden last, so what I did was I got loads and loads of layers of cardboard and paper packing tape and masking tape and I just built them up over a cobbler's anvil which for some weird reason my mum just has. The sole of the shoe would be stuck to the last with two small nails which will be removed um, once you finish the sewing just to hold everything in place. I didn't have those and I wasn't using wooden last so I just used regular push tacks and it worked okay. Next I cut out the vamp or the upper. Now the original shoes were side lacing and they would have been laced up at the side at the front of the foot with a very thin leather thong, something I found out with research that I did well after I filmed and made these shoes. So I'm doing this voiceover more than a year since I finished these shoes so I learned so much. Now, uh, if I'd have had the right tools, I would be making these holes with an awl. And before I could do that, I would use a pricking iron to mark the hole. Uh, my stitches will be completely evenly spaced. Now, I found an awl, which was not the best, but it worked. And here I am poking the stitch holes where I marked with my pricking iron which was actually just a pair of tweezers. I've now invested in leather tools and I would be really interested to try and remake these shoes now with the correct equipment and see what was different. Yes, I'm using a rock as a hammer. It was easier to control when hitting a pair of tweezers, just don't go there. Now, for the second sole, I found that it was really hard to get the marks deep enough with just my hands, so I used a rock as a hammer. What the medieval people would actually have used would be the aforementioned pricking irons and a wooden mallet or maul, um, which is a type of cobbler's hammer. Medieval shoemakers would have used wax linen thread, which would have come in a single ply, and you would then have used three sections um, of ever so slightly different lengths at the ends wrapped around a boar's bristle needle. Now, I didn't have anything like that, but I did have beading needles. So what I did was wax some cotton thread and I just put it through two beading needles and used them in the same way that you would with a boar's bristle brush. Now, you can see here that because the shoe is a turn shoe, it's made inside out. So these fluffy bits are actually the inside of my shoe once I have actually got the needle through the hole, which took some getting used to, let me tell you. It's nothing like sewing with fabric. I will be able to put needle through both sides one way and then the other needle will go through the same hole and you will be left with it like a little loop either side and you put it through the loop a bit like a blanket stitch but with two needles and that will create a knot either side of the seam of your shoe which means even if the thread breaks once you've worn the shoe for a while 
you will have knots all the way along your sock. This makes your shoe a lot more durable and it also means it's easier to repair because if the stitch breaks in one section, there's still loads of knots holding the shoe together. Make sure that the stitch holes for the vamp and the sole of my shoe actually lined up. I, for some reason, decided to make the holes as I went along, which was not the most time efficient way of doing it. I now know that you use the pricking irons all the way around the sole and it will just match up and then the area which overlaps either you stitch together or you use it as part of the fastening. But again, never made shoes before. Now I have proper leather tools, it's a lot easier because the pricking iron does several indents and then you just finish them off with your awl or if you don't want the stitches to show you go like through the side of the shoe um, but not all the way through to the other side of the leather which is known as flesh stitching. Didn't do that on this project because the leather was too thin. I think it was upholstery leather but it was what the charity shop had at the time and it worked. I have a usable pair of shoes that I have been wearing for well over a year. I wear them in the house as slippers, I wear them outside, it's been really interesting tracking the patterns of wear compared to the original and you can definitely see that the points of wear are, well frankly, where you'd expect them to be. <laughs> Luckily for us we keep bees so we have a pretty steady supply of beeswax. I melted it down in a little glass jar in some tin foil and then in a cup of boiling water. What I should actually have had is a block of beeswax which I rub into the leather or some lard because I'm a vegetarian I didn't want to use lard so I went for beeswax because well it's free when you keep bees. A bit cobbled literally cobbled together <laughs> but um sadly I didn't have a wooden mallet so I was just using a regular hammer and it worked pretty well. I think honestly the leather was so thin I didn't really need to hammer it. It works better with thick leather I think. Wrap that in something to stop it clanging. Don't mind me. I'm just eating the shoe. Where are you banging it? Well, the sides of my shoes are waxed and by hammering the sleeves one way and then the other, A, I soften it around here to turn it, but I also knit the fibres together. Why well, after the wax? Does it just come out over time? Yeah, well, you wax your thread and it helps it keep it together because even if the leather of the shoe wears away... Have you threaded it already then? Yeah, yeah, it's been threaded. You were sticking a sole on the bottom, or was that it? No, no, it's a turn shoe. The sole's already on the bottom. It's a what? It's a turn shoe. It, you do it in one and then you turn it inside out. I then just <laughs> kept on hammering and answering all of the questions that my family understandably had about why I was hitting a shoe with a hammer in the middle of a kitchen. <laughs> It was then finally time to sew on a button, so I raided my mum's vintage button box and found two of the most medieval looking buttons that we could find, and I sewed them on. I saw in one of my research books, Decapping Through Time, that it was customary to sew medieval buttons or toggles on with a little patch of leather there so that it wouldn't put the strain on the leather of the shoe itself and could be easily replaced. You know what? The Pope nice, of Catholic? This city might be nice sitting here doing f all in it. Yeah. Speak for yourself. I'm working. Yeah right. <laughs> I mean it is just sewing a button on a pair of shoes, mind, but very productive I'll have you know. Here you can see me treating the finished shoes with dubbins, which is a modern leather treatment usually used on horse tack. One of the marks that I'd looked at it and I thought that it was um, damage from um, burial. Actually, when I was making these, I made the same mark with the hammer as I was turning them out and hammering the seam closed. Oh, so that's something I wouldn't have known otherwise. Yeah. I'd not seen it in any of the yeah. um, stuff that I was reading and researching when I was trying to write yeah. about them. Yeah. 
So I love it, but a bit of experimental archaeology. I uh, actually discovered where one of the marks had come from by doing mm. that. So that was really, really interesting. The dubbin. Yeah, having a good old dubbin's at it. I don't know if dubbin's medieval. But it's they... not, but like I said, historically adequate, not historically accurate. I've got the... They might have treated it with something. Uh, tallow and beeswax. Yes. I have beeswax, but I don't have tallow, yeah. and we have dubbins in the house. Yeah. yeah, I'm not. I'm not including this in the report. I don't think. I'm just doing it because I want to wear these. <laughs> so there we go. All right, I'll leave them to dry, and that's that job jobbed. with how these turned out. I have been wearing them around the house and out into the garden and they're surprisingly comfortable and even more surprisingly, actually waterproof. My feet are dry, as far as I can tell. Although I haven't jumped in any puddles to really test them out. <laughs> so if I make another pair, I would definitely get thicker leather for the sole or I would actually buy leather, which is designed to make shoe soles out of. That's it. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you want more sewing and history based shenanigans, please like and subscribe. I hope to do more videos like this in the future. Let me know in the comments what you thought. Do you have any suggestions? What should I do next time? Let me know.